I'm Cameron DeVazier. And I'm Mark Howard. And this is Talking Points. We now are on the 11th lesson of the second quarter. Wow, can you believe it? it? It's incredible. We're getting close to the halfway mark of the year already. And it seems like we're still like coming out of 2020 and we're halfway through 2021 almost. Uh, one odd thing for our viewers too that they don't realize is we try to do these ahead of time. So then we go to our local churches for Sabbath school. I never know where we are. <laughs> yeah, I was loose Like track. we're like five or six weeks ahead. So I'm um, Wait a minute, didn't we cover that already? But it's anyway. just repetition is learning. It's good for That's everybody exactly to get right. back into it. It well, sure is. On this particular one, um, the the title is The New Covenant Sanctuary. Mm, what a great study. And of course, everything in the light of the covenant is looking at the framework of the old covenant and seeing how it applies in new covenant terms to us today. And I got to tell you, Pastor Howard, taking out, when we talk about the covenant that we have with God, that he has with us, yes. I should be clarified, and looking at the practical applications in our contemporary framework, to have one one week study on the sanctuary <laughs> is I'm not going to say criminal, but man, it's it, almost like 66 <laughs> chapters of Isaiah. And exactly, weeks. it's like man, it's like put everything about the sanctuary in one thing. When we're talking about the covenant, the sanctuary could be the theme of pretty much the whole thing. So we've got a lot packed into this week, and we're going to get into that in just a minute. But yeah. Pastor, Howard, why don't you give us a word of prayer, and then we'll walk through our talking points. Sure, let's pray. Father in heaven, we are thankful for your goodness to us, your mercy to us. We thank you, Lord, for your word, the testimony of your word, the rich experience you've given to your people, especially, Lord, that of the heavenly sanctuary and the earthly sanctuary as the model. We pray that as we, as we study this week's lesson, uh, our eyes and our understanding would be opened more to the work of Jesus in our behalf. We ask it and pray it in his name. Amen. Amen. Anyway, the intro is pretty clear from Sabbath afternoon. We take away the idea that this week we'll study the significance of the sanctuary yes. and its services as our model to help us understand the entirety of Christ's work for our redemption. And for anybody who may not be familiar with the terminology is just jumping into this, mm -hmm. could be also referred to as the tabernacle or yeah. as the earthly temple. Exactly right. The Those are all synonyms. We typically in... think of the sanctuary, the first one in the wilderness. Right. But, they, but the functionality of them all, as we're going to see in yes. the services and rites and ceremonies, was to was connected. It wasn't like they had some services here. It was one thread that all pointed to Jesus Christ. So we're going to get into that. Absolutely. But this week, talking point number one is the sanctuary reveals God's desire for reconciliation. Mm. This is yeah. a repeated recurring theme, and it's, it's justly so throughout this lesson quarterly, that God clearly wants to be close to his people. He mm. does. He's a God who created when he didn't have to, yes. and he wants a response of love. He didn't make automatons. And even when the heart of God was grieved by sin, he didn't abandon. He still comes after. And the sanctuary is just another one of those evidences of that. So we're going to get into that. That's taken from Sunday's lesson almost entirely. Talking point number two, the sanctuary hinged on substitutionary sacrifice. Uh, we can talk about all the frameworks and the dimensions and all the different elements of it, but the one thing that made the engine of redemption run as outlined in the sanctuary was that death and shed blood of a sacrifice. Right. That's taken from Monday and Tuesday's lesson. And finally, talking point number three is that the sanctuary outlined all of Christ's work for our redemption. Uh, we won't get too much into that right now, but that comes from Wednesday and Thursday, but essentially <laughs> There's not just one component where Jesus did the saving work here. No, no, no. The whole work that's outlined is the whole ministry of Jesus, and every bit of it is essential for our salvation. That's right. All right, so let's go back to number one. Yeah, let's talk about that. The sanctuary reveals God's desire for reconciliation. Now, we have talked about this on, a, if I'm not mistaken, more than one occasion already yes. this quarter that God is a God of, as the phrase keeps coming up, a God of relationships. Yes. He wants to be close to his people. Well, one of the things we said in our pre-discussion is, you know, very distinctly from the other gods of the nations, mm -hmm. the God of the Bible is a personal God. Yes. And part of being personal is having personal relationships. Like proximity, actually. So well, in, you see yeah. that, yes, and the lesson quarterly's brought that out repeatedly, that, that God desires mm -hmm. to have that personal relationship with his people. Right, and so God didn't have to make us, he did. He it even, or I should say, especially when we sinned, he could have discredited the whole race and just started over, but instead he goes to Adam and he calls for him. He, he, he sees the destruction of the world was necessary at the flood, but he saves out Noah and builds a boat. He calls Abraham out of the land of Ur of the Chaldees to be a father of the faithful. So he keeps initiating these covenantal relationships. And in quarterly uh, and Sunday paragraph two, uh, I've got it in the notes there. Well, prior to that, 
The, oh, I'm sorry. The, we got to look at these powerful texts. Yes. You know, the, the premise of this is Exodus 25, verse 8. When yes. you're talking about the sanctuary, the Bible says in Exodus 25, 8, uh, the Lord speaking, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Exactly. And so, right. very clearly, why does he want to make the sanctuary? Why does he want them to make it rather that he may dwell among them for that, you know, relationship aspect of things? Well, and. Piggybacking on that, Leviticus 26, verses 11, 12, was one of the passages included in our study, and it speaks to this very issue. It says, I will set my tabernacle among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. So it's even the, even there, the purpose of setting the tabernacle is set in relational terms. My soul shall not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your mm -hmm. God. You shall be my people. I am. He goes talking, talking again and again, like I'm going to come here so that we can be together, because clearly the desire of God's heart is reconciliation. Uh, yes. The New Testament talks about the ministry of reconciliation. That's what God wants. Is even even in the terms of the sacrificial system, it's called the atonement, which means at one minute to bring back together. That's right. So the sanctuary, as the talking point talks about, is a manifestation, if you will, of God's desire to be close to his people. Beautiful thought. But now let's go to talking point number two. Okay, before oh, we I'm go sorry, to number ahead. two, I didn't know if you were gonna share it. You had a, a oh, part yeah. of the quarterly there. Bring that out. Um, I wasn't gonna bring that out, actually. You can bring that out. <laughs> well, what were you I going to bring I was thinking <laughs> of, when we had talked about this before, when I read Exodus 25, 8, yes. let, them make, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. My mind is taken to John chapter 1 in the Gospel of John where the Bible says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And this Bible does not have the reference, but some of you who've done the study know that when it says dwelt among us, and some marginal readings will say tabernacle, tabernacle pitched his tent. In other words, John's language is drawing from the, the earthly sanctuary. And notice it says, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now his point is Jesus took a tent of human flesh mm -hmm. so that we could see the glory of God without being consumed by it. Mm. But he's drawing that from the earthly temple where God enshrouded his glory inside the tabernacle. Mm. In other words, the whole idea is why does he need a sanctuary that he may dwell among them? Because he couldn't come in the full force of his glory, they would all be consumed. So he veiled his glory in the sanctuary so that he could be in their midst and not consume them. And in the same way, this is what John is drawing, that same language of Jesus and the purpose of God in that, in the reason he wants to have the relationship is so that we can behold his glory because by beholding him, we become changed into mm -hmm. his image. So that's a big piece of that. You know, God doesn't is that just, just arbitrary to closeness right. for the sake of closeness. Right. Yeah. His purpose. He has a purpose in that closeness. Mm -hmm. He wants us to reflect his, his, to see his glory, to fall in love with that glory, and to reflect that glory. To well, us. and we're going to move into this later on. But I really appreciate that passage in John because in that passage in John, obviously he starts. There's only two books in the Bible that start with in the beginning. Right. It's Genesis chapter one, talking about the creation narrative, and then the gospel story of John in yes. the beginning. He's talking about God. Uh, Christ being the God in the beginning yes. who created. But then he goes down and said, and the same Exodus language then where he let me tabernacle yes. with you. He says Jesus did that. So clearly the God of the Old Testament, who's this old covenant God, yes. is the same. And that seems to be John's point. All that stuff yes. you've heard about creation and redemption and the whole Old Testament saga, that's Christ just coming close. And so the closeness that God wanted in the Old Testament, as we see in the rites and services and, and the structure of the tabernacle was to point us to Jesus. And why do we want to be close to Jesus? Not just for a buddy, not just to have yes. a friend, but to have a transformative, uh, redeeming uh, encounter. Ellen White yeah. writes about no, to know him is to love him, yes. right? And, and all of that comes from being in that, we've got to be in that proximity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so the Lord has devised a way for us to be in the presence of his glory and to be reflecting that glory. Well, let me kind of skip past. You can see it in the notes, the yeah. quarterly Sunday paragraph two, and of course it's in your mm -hmm. lesson. That's a fine quote, but I want to get to this point number two yes. as it connects to what we just talked about here, is that the sanctuary hinged on substitutionary sacrifice. Now you could look at Exodus 25 verse eight, where it says, let them make a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them, mm -hmm. and just pause right there and say, oh, he just wanted to be close. Mm -hmm. That's so nice. Or even to your point, oh, look at how good. It 
But just even being close in proximity to God or even observing God and his character traits, which are glorious and beautiful, right. that is insufficient for the problem we have, which is we've got sin. Right. And so the sanctuary, this is sub point number one and in, in, inside of that second talking point, that the sanctuary is more than a place to commune with God. It was a dynamic model for how God deals with sin. Absolutely. So we got to disabuse our minds that the only thing God wants is to be close again. He just misses us, and mm -hmm. be, which of course I think he does. But more than just being nearby, he wants to obliterate the problem that's causing the separation in the first place, which that's is exactly sin. Right. And so the model of the sanctuary is a functional structure, and its rites and ceremonies show in very great detail the process of God removing the sin and accepting the sinner. Yes. And so this whole, everything in this hinges on that substitutionary sacrificial system. It's not just rooms and it's not just dimensions and furniture. It's the blood of the sacrifice bringing out the redeeming uh, need yes. that we have. So anyway, brings that to the second point. The central feature of all the, heaven, all, all the sanctuary services was the shed blood of a substitutionary sacrifice. Now you had mentioned Leviticus 17. I think you already have yes. that. Verse 11. Mm -hmm. Why don't you read that for us and give us a little commentary on that. Leviticus 17, 11 says, For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Now, that, that whole idea of the life of the flesh being in the blood, there's two things that we get out of that. The one is the more obvious that we always talk about. The blood symbolizes Jesus dying on the cross. And so the life given up. And so yeah. the life given up, that's how you get the blood. But, but I guess this, this train of thought started with me some time ago where, you know, we talk about the blood cleansing. And I got to thinking, well, from a human physiological standpoint, the way blood cleanses, like if I get a cut, my blood cleanses it from the inside out, mm. right? I don't pour blood on myself, You're right? right? And, I need and some I blood. I gotta, yeah. But then I thought of that in the terms of the life of the flesh is in the blood. And in the sanctuary service, the blood would be taken and applied certain places. You had mentioned that the priest would take that blood, and we're going to get into that in the next point a little bit. But the, the, the blood doesn't only symbol, uh, symbolize death in the sanctuary. It also symbolizes life. No, no, it's part I know people are going to just skip right past that point, mm -hmm. but listen to what he just said, that the blood doesn't just symbolize death, it also symbolizes life. And that's so often, because we, that's right. we're going to get into this in a minute, but too often our understanding of the blood shed of Christ is that, oh, he died, and that's so really... So you think of Galatians 2.20, where Paul okay. says, I am crucified with Christ. That's the death of Christ. Mm -hmm. Yet I live, but not I. Christ lives, there's the life of Christ, mm -hmm. in me. And he's getting that concept. This is where mm. Paul was educated. So the life of Jesus gave up his life, but he gave it up to give it to you and me. Mm -hmm. Not just as an arbitrary, like, oh, I'm going to spill a certain amount right. of blood and that's going to cancel off a debt. It's actually a blood transfusion kind of process. And it's when you think about that from the father's standpoint, God's like, oh, somebody's got to die for this mess. Mm -hmm. But God's thinking of a way, how can I save humanity? First, the penalty has to be paid and Jesus dies our substitutionary mm. death. But then there has to be brought a new life into humanity mm. or Jesus. And we were talking about this with Paul talking about the resurrection of Christ. Like if, if all we have is the crucifixion of Christ, we're of all the people the most to be pitied if there's no resurrection from the dead. Like there's got to be a raising to newness of life. Well, and the lesson does kind of touch on that. Um, I don't want to say accidentally, but on Tuesday's lesson, it, it, it brings this out and to the point you're speaking of, and this is the middle of the section where we're starting with substitution. It says, substitution is the key to the entire plan of salvation, which is absolutely true. Because of our sins, we deserve to die. Out of his love for us, Christ gave himself for our sins. Again, Galatians, this time 1 verse 4. He died the death we deserve. The death of Christ as the substitute for sinners is the great truth from which all other truths flow. And that's where we get this concept of the, the substitutionary sacrificial death, the shedding of the blood, is the central feature of the sanctuary. But it goes on to say, our hope, that of restoration, of freedom, of forgiveness, of eternal life in paradise, rests upon the work that Jesus did, that of giving himself for our sins. Without that, our faith would be meaningless. Now, mm -hmm. that phrase caught my mind, yes. because the, the lesson is making a very clear point that without the death of Jesus, our faith would be meaningless, which mm -hmm. is true. But by stopping it there, it could give the implication that 
But now that we have the death, now everything's good. But now look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 where Paul speaks about this, because there was a group of people who didn't believe in a resurrection from the dead, and they thought, once you're dead, you're just dead. But Paul makes this point, uh, verse 14, and if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. And in verse 17, if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins. So not only do we need the death of Jesus to pay a penalty, Mm -hmm. We also need the life of Jesus That's right. that he can offer us. So he's not only, it's, it's not just essential that he was the lamb, he's got to also be the living interceding priest. He's got to have the whole process. And, and, and I think point three is getting into this a little bit, but yes. this, is the, this is the sanctuary. In other words, yes. the, the death of Christ is the courtyard. Yes. And, and if, if we're just like, that was everything... There is no need for the sanctuary. It right. was the sanctuary, and the, and the lesson asks the question, I think it's on Monday, um, what prophetic significance was there in the animal sacrifices? Well, clearly, and it gives some passages, but they pointed forward to Jesus' sacrifice, and thus they give insight into the far-reaching effects of that sacrifice, right. far beyond that courtyard. And I think about Galatians 1, where you just uh, quoted that Christ was given, uh, God gave him for our sins. And I don't recall, I'd have to look it up, whether it was Ellen White who said this or not, but I think it was appropriate that it said that Jesus did not only give himself for the race, he gave himself, himself to, to the, the race. race. Yeah. And that's what we're talking about. Like, it wasn't just that he died for us. He became one of us, and he, he gave his life to humanity, mm -hmm. for humanity and to humanity, that, again, like we can say with the Apostle Paul, now Christ lives in me. Christ enabled me to be who I couldn't have been without, and that mm. is part of that salvation process. Well, we're, gonna, we're kind of, as you mentioned, kind of dipping into our third talking point, so we're going to revisit this in just a minute. But let's finish up this idea about the importance and this, the centrality of that substitutionary sacrifice. Yes. Okay? Now, the blood of all the animals sacrificed in the sanctuary services were a symbol or type of the blood of Jesus. Some of our mm -hmm. dispensational centers say, well, God established a way for them to be saved before just by blood, but now we have this sacrifice of Jesus. Friends, they were never saved by the blood of goats and bulls, right? Those were always shadows or types or symbols right. of the great lamb who when was Jesus. When Acts 4.12 says there's only one name given among men then, under heaven, yeah. by which we, and I got that out order a little bit, by which we must be saved, they meant there's only one way, only one name, and that's the name of Jesus. Right. The sacrifice of Jesus, it wasn't any other way. People weren't saved by the law in the Old Testament. They weren't saved by animal sacrifices. That's right. There's only one means of salvation, and that's through Jesus. Which is why I'm glad this is called this whole lesson is called the covenant. Yes. Because we talk about old and new, and there are senses in which there's an old and new, but the reality is there's been one plan of salvation all that's, along overarching right. the whole thing, and that's all on Christ and his death. So and let's be clear about that. we call the everlasting covenant. Right, and there are scripture passages aplenty to bring this home, but Isaiah 53 verses 4 through 12 talk about yes. how God has laid on him the iniquity of us all, and by his stripes we are healed. Yes. Uh, Hebrews 10, oh, it's a fascinating 10 verses there. you got to read through it, but it essentially makes that same point that yes. it, all that stuff is insufficient. What we need is the genuine sacrifice of Christ. Now, I did add this in here, and we, we'll take just a second, but the sacrifice of Christ was unique, not just in the sense that he was sinless. Yes. Because there are other sinless creatures in existence then and now. Sure. All the angels. All the angels, example. the unfallen world. We, we don't know all of them, but the ones we have by name, we know they're not sinners. They're yes. still in the presence of God. But in the plan of redemption, the blood of even an innocent created being would still be insufficient. Uh, oftentimes we might think, well, obviously the blood of bulls and goats, that's insufficient because they're just animals. Right. But even a really good person or even a, a perfect angel would be insufficient to the task. And I believe it's the case because, and we don't have time to get into this, but in the great controversy story, the great problem in the beginning was a rebellion against God himself and his mm -hmm. law and his character. It, right. was, it was a smear on the name of God. And the if offense God was to, not against a created being, it was against the creator. Exactly. So he can't say, you are not self-sacrificing. He's like, I'll show you. <laughs> Gabriel, you go die. He's like, whoa, whoa, that actually proves my point. That's right? right. It has to be one who is inherently God, who has yes. that life in himself, yes. who instigated the law, who who's the creator. And so this is why it makes this interesting point. Is in, 
Early writings, page 127, she said, Angels were so interested for man's salvation that there could be found among them those who would yield their glory and give their life for perishing men. Well, isn't that sweet? That's great. Mm. But, said my accompanying angel, that would avail nothing. The transgression was so great that an angel's life would not pay the debt. So, and notice, it, it doesn't say the anger of God is so great that he has to be appeased by a mm -hmm. bigger sacrifice. It said the problem was so big, it's bigger than, yes. the, than a created being could pay off. Nothing but the death and intercession of God's Son would pay the debt and save lost man from hopeless sorrow and misery. So Now, the, back to your point, mm -hmm. it doesn't say nothing but the death. It yes. says nothing but death and, and intercession. intercession. This is the whole ministry of Christ that we're seeing in the sanctuary. By the way, this is early writings. Yes. 70 years later, <laughs> same unbroken. It's not like That's there right. was an evolution of thought with it. It's, it's been very clear in Adventist understanding of this that it's been the death of Jesus combined with the interceding life of Jesus I, as priest. My mind is drawn to Hebrews 3 where the Apostle Paul says, I want you to consider Christ Jesus, the uh, the apostle, which is, you know, yeah. and the high priest of mm -hmm. our profession. So in other words, the one, when you think of Jesus as the one who sent, that's more of the sacrifice, the yes. life and... But then the high priest part in the apostles very clear in Hebrews 3, 1, I want you to think of him in both ways because that complaint <laughs> forms the completeness of his ministry. Which so naturally brings us to point number three. <laughs> the sanctuary outlined all of Christ's work for our redemption. That's right. And, you know, I, I've been preaching lately uh, this this because this, it's been on my mind that there's this notion that there's the gospel that we're yes. saved by and then there's some added stuff like the sanctuary and the intercession and the judgment <laughs> and his it's like whoa 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 so I, I challenge my own mind and i challenge people to think about it like at what point have you preached the gospel if you just gave a christmas story where jesus became human and was born in a manger have you preached the gospel uh, no and you could walk through it and every and even as we just established you could preach the death of christ on the cross and paul himself says if he hadn't risen from the dead we would still be in our sins. That's, That's not right. the good enough news. The sanctuary is so helpful to see that Christ's sacrifice was not limited to one particular encounter, or one even the right. event of the cross, that it's all connected in one seamless ministry. And so uh, each step, I put this in the notes here, each step of the sacrificial process foreshadowed the distinct and equally essential stages of Christ's work for redemption. Right. And as you walk through it, of course, you think of the storyline of the, of the sacrificial lamb. First, he was born and raised in the camp among sinners, but had to be without spot or blemish, representing the sinless life and uh, perfect sacrifice that right. he was. Then he goes into the courtyard for his public ministry, which culminated in the sacrifice of himself for our sins, right? So the laying on of hands, like the weight of sin put on, like in Gethsemane, then the sacrifice, which represented Calvary, the shed blood. But if that's, if all we had was the camp and the courtyard, we could say, hey, the death was everything. That's right. But there's those, that's only halfway that's through. That's right. There's the holy that's place and the most holy place, right? So as soon as that blood was spilled, it didn't just pour it on the ground and be like, well, go home and be blessed, it was all done. Yeah. There was another figure, the priest, which also, was a representation of Christ who would take that blood and go into the holy place. Now, the thing well, about if you the would holy take, place... If you would take that concept mm -hmm. and you go, for example, to Hebrews chapter 8 and the first few verses there where mm -hmm. the Apostle Paul says that if Christ were on the earth, he could not be a priest. Mm. In other words, Paul's clear that his priestly ministry had to begin when he left the earth after a sacrifice, mm. which... which pushes it beyond the cross. It has mm -hmm. to be, in other words, the, the, and, and not to diminish the cross, but the cross was that, we were talking about it earlier, a sacrifice, ha, a, a priest rather, had to have a sacrifice. That It was by virtue of the sacrifice that he did his priestly work. Mm -hmm. That sacrifice was on the cross. The cross was essential to the priestly work, uh, for that priest to work. But mm -hmm. without a sacrifice, the priest had no ministry. And now, by the way, you invoked Paul writing in Hebrews here, which is absolutely true. Now, this is the same Paul who said... And we don't take contention. Some no, people may say I'm, it wasn't I'm Paul. Not, I'm not getting into the authorship, but, but, but assuming that it's true, because yes. Ellen White says so, let's be clear. <laughs> um, but assuming that that's the case, and even if it weren't, but Paul says, I determined to know nothing except Christ and him crucified. So people say, there's right. the gospel. But then he comes and writes the book that said, now this is the main point That's right. of what we're saying, is that we have a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. So he said, of course the death of Christ is what I like to call the fuel that makes the engine of redemption run, but just spilling it on the ground and accomplishing a death 
It's more than the death of the, of the animal. It's the life of the priest who ministers that death and can offer it to us, right? That's right. And, so and just he for says clarification, because I already have 1 Corinthians 15 open, the apostle says, For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose the third day according to the Scriptures. So mm -hmm. there, it's just, you know, his gospel yeah, he, But he's that. got process language, yes. not event language. He doesn't just say, Jesus died, Jesus died, mm -hmm. Jesus died. He's like, he was born, he lived, he died, he rose. He, <laughs> he's, it's all of it, right? Yes. And again, that's our point, that the same sanctuary outlined all of Christ's work for our redemption. Now, when we transition into heaven, which, mind you, is the present phase of Christ's ministry, we can talk a lot about his life on the earth, his public ministry, mm -hmm. the Garden of Gethsemane, the weight of sin, the death on Calvary, and a lot of coverage is given at, as it should be. But it is an insufficient message if all we talk about is as where it Jesus was. it should be, because it's, it's part of a process, but it's part of the process of salvation, right. but you don't want to leave a piece out. And exactly. That's the, well, so we're not diminishing the one. It's just like let's finish the book. You know. <laughs> well, even more to that point, when when Noah preached, yes, if he talked about all the stuff that was wonderful about creation, would it have been true? Yes. Sure. But if he never mentioned the boat. Right? right? That's the big rock in the jar um, of his ministry. That's the no, thing. No, what's the thing back there? <laughs> and he's like, oh, what? don't worry about it. Oh, oh, that big thing? Anyway, it's the boat, it, blah, 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 blah. Let's really <laughs> talk about his love and, and family issues. Or if John the Baptist had preached, but he saw Jesus in the crowd and didn't point, hey, there's where he is. <laughs> yeah. That's the Lamb of God. Seventh-day Adventists who do not preach Christ's present work in the heavenly sanctuary are like Noah not preaching the boat and John right. not pointing to Jesus. That's right. She is in a work right now. So we're always talking about what Jesus did, and of course we should. But to leave it there without moving it into the living where he's presently ministering is a disservice, and I believe not what God has called this movement to do. So. Yeah. When we look at the holy place and most holy place symbols... For, for lack of a better illustration, it's like watching a team play a game and cheering them on and then turning off the game in the last two minutes. Yeah, when it's all like decided, the big end. Because the, the, where, where Jesus is in the heavenly sanctuary, like this is the culmination. This is where he's wrapping it all up. Yes. Like, why would you not? That's that's the culmination of everything. It's, it's in fact, a magnification of the cross, if you will. Yes, it is. And, and Mrs. White makes a statement. I don't have it here, but she says... On the cross, Christ began that work, which he ascended in heaven to complete. So it's not That's like right. he did a work and then another work. and It's all one work. That's right. And the key is the worker, Jesus Christ. So he is our gospel message. Um, and again, we don't have the time today to get into mm. a deep study of Christ's heavenly ministry, what it entails, intercession, and especially the most holy place of the judgment work before he returns. But suffice it to say, the point of our burden today is to show that the... The message we've been given to bear, the truth for this time, is not merely what Jesus did, but what he's currently doing in that heavenly sanctuary above. So in, in the lesson here... Um, what did you want to do with Hebrews 9? If we can't read it, we want to no, at least direct no, look them at to it. it. Yeah, Hebrews 9 verses 20. We've got right time here. to do it. Go for it. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens, speaking about the earthly temple, should be purified with these, speaking about the animal sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these, for Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Not that he should offer himself often as a high priest enters the most holy place every year with the blood of another. He then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now, once at the end of the ages, he has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, apart from sin, for salvation. Mm. So that passage leads us right up until the mm. future, where, which I believe is soon and very soon, where Christ will return. Coming. And so what he's doing now in the heavenly sanctuary is preparing and inheriting that kingdom so that when he comes, mm. this great controversy will be wrapped up. Well, and what's interesting is it says when he comes back, he comes back apart from sin. And, mm. and some translations say without reference to sin, not to deal with sin. In other words, Priests dealt with sin, but mm -hmm. Jesus doesn't come back as a priest. He comes back as a king. king. In other words, his priestly work is now, and when he comes back, he's done as a Amen. priest. So if you want his, to avail yourself of him as a priest, now, now is the, the day. time Today to do is it. the day of salvation, yes, right? Yes, indeed. Well, and sometimes that can be an intimidating thing. Like, oh, Jesus was so nice to give his love, but now he's judging. Now he's up. Uh, 
But there's a really great point brought out in Thursday's quarterly uh, paragraph two. It says, we sinful fallen humanity, we who would be consumed by the brightness of God's glory if we faced it now, we, no matter how bad we have been or how blatantly we've been violated God's law, have someone, capital S, who appears in the presence of God for us. We have a representative standing before the Father on our behalf. Think of how loving, forgiving, and accepting Christ was here on earth. This same person is now our mediator in heaven. Amen. So it's not like they had the, there's the earthly Jesus, but now there's the heavenly. He's the same <laughs> Jesus. And the That's Jesus right. that we love for his ministry on earth is the same Jesus who loves us for his ministry in heaven. Amen. So uh, why don't you read for us the summary for Friday there at the Friday's very end. Friday's summary just says uh, the old covenant sacrificial system was replaced by the new. Instead of animals being sacrificed by sinful priests in an earthly sanctuary, we now have Jesus, our perfect sacrifice. He represents us before the Father in the sanctuary in heaven, which forms the basis of the new covenant and its promises. Beautiful. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the richness of this covenant truth and the sanctuary model. But most importantly, more than the model, more than the type, thank you for the anti-type who is Jesus Christ. Yeah. Thank you for his life, his death, and now his life again as our interceding advocate in the courts of heaven. Lord, help us to see the same Jesus yesterday, today, and forever. As the one who loves us, cares for us, and wants us in heaven, help us to have the same desire to be with him that he has for us. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.